We live in a world that is increasingly confused on the subject of love. This subject was once again forced into the forefront of our minds just this past week by the watershed decision of our U.S. Supreme Court regarding the definition of marriage. Love has won. That was the chant on the steps of the Supreme Court building this past Friday. Yet, in addition to the clear testimony of both Old Testament and New Testament scriptures, which, granted, rings with authority only to those who are professing believers, and I believe even only to a subset of those, In addition to the clear testimony of Scripture, basic biology, simple psychology, the witness of history, and common sense all converge to point unmistakably in the exact same direction. That marriage is a pairing of one man and one woman in a lifelong complementary relationship toward the bearing and rearing and enculturating of the next generation. Prior to this century, which is only about 15 years old, every culture on earth has recognized that fact. And often apart from any appeal to religious reasoning at all, based only on sociological insights alone, many of them, What is best for the survival and the well-being of the group? And yet, this week, five of nine lawyers, allegedly among the brightest of our enlightened age, can entirely ignore such a transparent truth. Now, I am not generally given to criticizing public officials whose jobs are exceedingly difficult, exceedingly challenging. And I am especially not inclined to expect clear reasoning from from people who have no room in their concept of the universe for the necessary existence of a wise and powerful God. There's a need there that needs to be addressed and only the gospel can address it. So I'm not generally given to critiquing such folk. But in this case, I do not stand alone in my shock at the breathtaking blindness of the majority of our nation's highest court. The strongest language of disagreement I have yet heard comes from the four dissenting justices who are recognizing the implications of the decision. Listen to Justice Antonin Scalia. This is a naked judicial claim to legislative, indeed super-legislative, power. A claim fundamentally at odds with our system of government. The opinion in these cases is the furthest extension, in fact, and the furthest extension one can even imagine of the court's claimed power to create, quote, liberties that the Constitution and its amendments neglect to mention. The practice of constitutional revision by an unelected committee of nine, always accompanied, as it is today, by extravagant praise of liberty, robs the people of the most important liberty they asserted in the Declaration of Independence and won in the Revolution of 1776. The freedom to govern themselves. But what really astounds is the hubris reflected in today's judicial putsch. And I had to look up that word. It means a violent attempt to overthrow a government. So let me read that definition. But what really astounds is the hubris of today's violent attempt to overthrow a government. The five justices who compose today's majority are entirely comfortable concluding that every state violated the Constitution for all of the 135 years 
between the 14th Amendment's ratification and Massachusetts' permitting of same-sex marriage in 2003. Justice Clarence Thomas agrees. The court's decision today, he wrote, is at odds not only with the Constitution, but with the principles upon which our nation was built. Since well before 1787, liberty has been understood as freedom from government action, not entitlement to government benefits. Yet the majority invokes our Constitution in the name of, quote, liberty that the framers would not have recognized to the detriment of the liberty they sought to protect. Along the way, it rejects the idea captured in our Declaration of Independence that human dignity is innate and suggests that instead it comes from the government. This distortion of our Constitution not only ignores the text, it inverts the relationship between the individual and the state in our republic. So it turns the Constitution on its head, is what Justice Thomas is saying. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, Supporters of same-sex marriage have achieved considerable success persuading fellow citizens through the democratic process to adopt their view. That ends today. Five lawyers have, chose, have closed the debate and enacted their own vision of marriage as a matter of constitutional law. The majority's decision is an act of will, not legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this court's precedent. These are amazingly strong words, aren't they? Proving, at very least, that the political divide in this country that shows up so clearly every election season and on almost every public policy debate in between election seasons, that divide runs right through the middle of our Supreme Court as well. And it leaves us wondering, what will be the outcome of these matters? Even the simplest among us can see that Life in these United States fundamentally shifted on Friday. But what will be the outcome of these matters? That question alone awakens hot anger in some and almost paralyzing fear in others. How can such supposedly competent people be so 180 out from one another on such basic moral issues? How is that possible? How can we lose our way so badly? And how high a price will we pay as a nation because of it? But this whole scenario also raises the question of what the church is supposed to do at such times. How are we supposed to respond? That's the question we need to be asking and answering. And it is then that we begin to realize how very easy, how very easy it is to lose our way in this world. We don't just see it represented among a majority of the Supreme Court. We see it running through the entire society. As a matter of fact, in a society that is so deeply divided on so many points, that is the one consistent point among them all. How very easy it is to lose our way. You see, God's call to Christians in times of oppression and of government opposition, and make no mistake, my friends, we just entered that season here. If not clearly before, the line may be somewhere behind us, and many would argue that it is, but if it isn't, it was at least crossed this week. God's call to Christians in times of oppression and government opposition is just not that hard to discern in Scripture. The hard part is hearing it, tolerating it, honestly. The hard part is obeying it. We can see that something is wrong, and we feel compelled to speak out against it. But, but what to say and, and, and how to say it, that's what often baffles us. That's what often throws us off course. But more, 
what it appears we should say from Scripture, and how it appears that we should say it, well, just too often that seems wrong. It just seems wrong to us in the moment. And therein lies our test to see whether we have lost our way. We've seen how easy it is to be confused on matters of biblical principle when they come to bear on public events. When we look at the events in Charleston, South Carolina just a week ago, some have really struggled with families of the victims offering forgiveness so quickly, and it's touched off quite a bit of public debate on that subject. Something about it sounds biblical to us believers, but something also sounds very wrong, like it's trying to let a mass murderer off the hook. I really appreciated Russell Moore's recent blog on that topic. And by the way, I'm going to quote from him three times this morning. I'll just let you know that in advance because I've appreciated his thinking through not only this issue, but the one of this past Friday. He gives some very helpful perspective. On this point, as we're struggling with this concept of forgiveness for a mass murderer who just gunned down members of your family, Moore wrote, the victim's families are not saying that the terrorist should escape without penalty. For the state to allow him to do so would itself be an immoral act. The state dispenses justice, and I love this point. The state dispenses justice, not gospel mercy, because the state was not crucified for our sins. The state's responsibility is to maintain justice by punishing evildoers. When we forgive, whether in the wake of an enormity such as this one, or in the more mundane ways we have been hurt, we are not saying vengeance is not due. We are saying that vengeance is God's, not ours. We don't need to exact justice from one who has sinned against us because we know that God will judge every sin either at the judgment seat or, more hopefully, at the cross as the offender unites himself to the one who is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That sort of forgiveness frees us to work together for justice including justice against murderers and terrorists, because these matters remain matters of public justice, not of personal payback. Very, very helpful and clarifying thoughts. And such a rich biblical perspective on forgiveness can help us immensely to hear and to obey biblical instruction in response to the Supreme Court decision as well. It can help us in that regard. It is no accident, I don't believe, that we're standing on the threshold of 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, as this decision is handed down. That is by God's sovereign appointment, I believe, and I heartily believe it, because therein is the essence of the best answer. It's the foundation of the best answer. Therein is our disposition, not just toward brothers and sisters in the church, but toward our neighbors, and even toward our enemies in the world. Jesus answered the Pharisees in Matthew 22 saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When he was asked the question at a different time about what that looks like, he told the story of the Good Samaritan, a foreigner helping you at a time of need. Jesus preached to the crowds in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, how are you different than the unbeliever? The thing that sets the believer apart is this. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus taught his disciples about the immense evangelistic impact of love when he said there in the upper room on the very night that he was betrayed, instructing his disciples before going and facing the fullest opposition of the world and the flesh and the devil, Jesus said to them, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. James wrote to his 
scattered, suffering flock, saying, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. And Peter charged his persecuted flock, saying, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. That's opposition, that reviling word. Remember studying 1 Peter? Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Peter wrote, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And later on in the next chapter, he added, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, this is when the church is facing the hottest opposition. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. On all my friends, in these days, a multitude of sins are in need of being covered. Love is our calling, even at the hardest of times. Without it, as we have already seen in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, even the very greatest of our actions and responses is entirely empty. It is nothing, Paul says, twice in those three verses. And how ironic is that? We are called to respond in genuine Christ-like love even to a situation like this that seems entirely rooted in a fundamental misunderstanding of love. A reversal of its meaning. The meaning of His redeeming love that should be illustrated most clearly in this life and marriage. And yet in response to the distortion of that very fundamental reality, we are called to respond in love. And if whatever response we have is void of love, it's worthless. Peter also wrote to, the, to his people that it's by doing good, it's by loving that you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. What a great reminder from 1 Peter 2. Well, my friends, this is our challenge Today, this is the challenge that today's church has been handed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Will you love in response to government opposition? So we have to ask the question, what should our love look like? What should our love look like? And therein we turn to the text of Scripture. And I invite you to join me on, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, page 960 in your pew Bible. There are 15 qualities of love in verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 13. Very familiar passage. We will cover five of them today, which all appear in the very first verse, verse 4. I read it to you a few moments ago, but again, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. And I didn't even give us an outline this, uh, this morning because we're just going to walk through these verses and be reminded of what this looks like. We are put in a place where love is most challenging. It is time for us to look back again at the Scriptures and see what its qualities are. So, love is patient. That doesn't need much explanation, does it? Love is patient. Obviously, this means a willingness to wait, even to wait a long time, but there's more to it than that. It also insinuates endurance without caving in. And by the way, that description is based in large part on D.A. Carson's book on 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and I will use a number of his definitions throughout, so I feel the need to make mention of that. Those of you who have read that book might recognize some of these descriptions, but they're also interwoven with some of the works of others. Patience is a willingness to wait and to endure 
for a long time without caving in to whatever it's waiting for. It, it, it could mean a long fuse. Or as, as Leon Morris put, the opposite of short-tempered. Wow, how you doing? Love is the opposite of short-tempered. Love has a, a long fuse. It's patient. How you doing on this issue? Thinking about that quality. But you know what? Wait for a moment. It gets, it gets better. It gets better here. Patience here carries the idea of endurance of injuries without retaliation. That's just the first of the 15 qualities. Endurance of injuries without retaliation. That's sort of tied up in the meaning of this word. It shows itself then, this love as patience, shows itself as forbearance and forgiveness. You can see the link between patience and forbearance and forgiveness in Colossians 3. Forbearance, and I love John Piper's definition of this word, forbearance endures with the sin and strangeness of others. Is that a timely definition or what? It doesn't take much effort to look around and see both the sin and the strangeness of others. And as deeply divided as we talked about our nation being in these days, it's all sides that look at the other and think, wow, not just sinful, but strange, strange. So do we shout red-faced back and forth at one another? Or do we recognize that love as patience calls us to forbearance and forgiveness? Enduring with the sin and strangeness of others is forbearance and forgiveness frees them from any relational debt because of that sin or strangeness. And it does so not because that debt is ignored or just canceled. Love is patient and can forgive because Jesus absorbed the death at the cross. He absorbed that in His death at the cross. The debt of that sin. You see, He absorbed the cost of our sin against Him and He forgave us at the cross when we receive Him by faith. But He also absorbed the cost of others' sins against us. Such that we can forgive them like He forgave us. We forgive in imitation of Christ because His forgiveness has been granted to us by faith and we now extend that in meaningful ways to the world. And I believe that starts to get at what the families of the victims in Charleston, South Carolina were trying to do. Again, Colossians 3, verse 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Indiscriminate. Whatever grievances. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Follow His example. That sounds tough, doesn't it? in these circumstances. But Jesus went even stronger in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Almost makes it sound like he's making our forgiveness conditional upon being able to forgive. But now he's just saying that it's so much a part of the forgiveness that you receive from him that if it doesn't extend to others, it's likely not real in your own heart. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. That's amazing. Patience is a godly quality. In Romans 2, Paul poses a question. Do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance, and patience. You hear him linking those? Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not even recognize the fact that God holding back his hand of judgment on your sin is, is in hope of your repentance and belief? It's in hope that the death of Christ that has already been offered might come to bear on your sin. And free you of the penalty of it. That's what coming to repentance means. That the burden of my sin has been transferred to Christ and I've been set free not because He's just ignoring my sin, but because He's taken the penalty of it Himself. 
Do you not presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And it almost sounds like Peter answers the question that is asked there in, by Paul in Romans 2. That's in 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God, in his loving patience, is waiting for the repentance of all who will believe. And that's the God against which this age rails for setting up such parameters as are so clearly present in his word regarding love and marriage and so many other topics. That God is loving and patient and kind toward us, providing a way of escape and patiently waiting for us to receive it. God is patient. Love is patient. How about you? How about me? Love is also kind. Kindness, as Paul uses it here, just sort of reemphasizes patience. In fact, you, you heard the link between patience and kindness even in these other passages that we read, right? The kindness of God is mentioned twice in that question that Paul poses in Romans 2, Romans 2 right alongside of patience and forbearance and forgiveness. So kindness, as Paul uses it here, sort of re-emphasizes patience and then builds on that foundation. This is the only time this word appears as a verb in the New Testament. But it does appear, the corresponding adjective appears some different times, sometimes translated good, as it will be right over in chapter 15 of this very same letter, or sometimes translated kind, as it is in Ephesians 4. So... Love reacts with goodness toward those who ill-treat it. It gives itself in kindness in the service of others. That's the nature of love. That's what love looks like. That's the love we express in this day, even at times of hardship and difficulty where we feel the opposition of the culture and even of the government. Love reacts with goodness toward those who ill-treat it and gives itself in kindness in the service of others. Even to those who may have hurt it. Love, in other words, is quick to pay back with kindness what it received and hurt. That's the nature of love as kindness. It searches for opportunities to do that. That's the intensity of love. It looks forward for for opportunities. It looks to them. It it beats the bushes for them. Opportunities to repay, repay in kindness what it received and hurt. That's just unpacking the words. How are we doing on this issue? Expressing love as kindness. Let's personalize it a bit. Does kindness come forth in your relationship with your gay colleague or neighbor? That's a good test of love, isn't it? Does kindness just come forth in those encounters, in those relationships? My friends, don't fear showing kindness. Jesus is with you. And it is not often that a neighbor or a colleague is as aggressive or articulate as the activists that we endure on the TV news shows. We're called to love our neighbor. And as we see the sovereignty of God all over, not just the text of Scripture we're studying today, but but over our very lives and the day in which we live, as we'll say more about in just a few moments, As we see the sovereign hand of God guiding us day by day through this life, do you think it's any accident that your neighbors are your neighbors? Does that catch God by surprise or did he place them there for purpose? Are we more blinded by the developments of this age 
to the actual need that's before us? Or are we able to see with the very eyes of Christ and to recognize opportunities to minister in his name? So love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not crave that which it does not have. It does not covet the successes or the possessions or the relationships or the abilities, the gifts of of others. Love isn't like that. Because it doesn't seek its own. We'll, We'll get to that later in this very passage. Love is satisfied in God and what God has provided. It is content in Him. Love does not envy. Think about this. Love does not even crave better days. Under what it perceives as better presidents or better legislatures or better courts. It doesn't crave that. Add in patience and kindness and love doesn't even regret its time in history. Love does not try to shame those who live in that time of, in history and who espouse the aberrant ideas that are so troubling at that period of history. Love doesn't look away from its present moment. Love receives that as an assignment from a sovereign God. It's not envious of better days. It was again Russell Moore who wrote, Some Christians will be tempted to anger, lashing out at the world around us, With a narrative of decline, that temptation is wrong. God decided when we would be born. And when we would be born again. We have the Spirit and the Gospel. To think that we deserve to live in different times is to tell God that we deserve a better mission field than the one He has given us. We don't want to do that. We want to trust God. That this is the day of our assignment. This is the time in which we have been called to live faithfully. So, love does not envy better days. And it doesn't regret its time in history. And it doesn't try to shame those who are against it during those days. Rather, love calls out to them with the proclamation and the power of the gospel. And it longs for their repentance and restoration. Love is not envious. Love does not boast. This word also occurs only here in the New Testament. It carries the connotation of ostentatious bragging in other first century writings. So love, we might say, doesn't doesn't gloat over its successes. It doesn't crave what others have and it doesn't strut what it has. That's what we've seen so far. It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't gloat. It doesn't crave what others have. It doesn't strut what it has. So love doesn't go out dancing in the streets when the court decisions go in its favor any more than it sulks in the corner when they don't. Because love is not so self-centered as that. It doesn't use itself as a measure of anything on any level. Love doesn't. It always looks to Christ and imitates Him just like He looks to His Father and does what His Father says. Love is not self-promoting. It is not boastful. Love is also not arrogant. Wow. This is more broad than boasting. Saying love is not proud. But it doesn't even have that underlying disorder that feels the need to boast. So what Paul is saying here is that love doesn't boast. And it doesn't even have to catch its boasting at the edge of its lips. It it doesn't even have the heart that flows forth into boasting. Love is not arrogant. 
This word can also be translated puffed up, as it is a couple of times already in this letter, back in chapter 4 and chapter 8. Paul specifically rebuked these Corinthians for that vice of being puffed up, of being arrogant. He's used the word arrogant. It's been translated that way several times as well. But those a couple of occasions where we read puffed up, it's the same word. So if he has explicitly rebuked the Corinthians for this vice, on a number of previous occasions already in this letter, here we must read him as also doing so implicitly. He's called them away from this puffed up arrogance. But now he's letting them know that the love without which all of their spiritual gifts are empty is not puffed up. It's not arrogant. So how are we doing at loving? (laughs) Wow. How are we doing at loving? It's a convicting question, isn't it? It almost seems unfair to ask it today. How are we supposed to love our neighbor in a world that keeps going in the direction that ours has gone in this past week or two? How? My friends, these are dark days. That's what I've heard many say. These are dark days. The darkest days we can remember, even the elderly among us, have said it that way. How are we supposed to love when surrounded by such darkness? Well, I think we have to begin by remembering that there actually have been even darker days. Darker days than this. In fact, the darkest day in human history was not this past Friday. Nor was it the day after any recent or distant election. The darkest day in human history to those who endured it was another Friday, nearly 2,000 years ago now. Just after sunrise, our Lord Jesus Christ was convicted of a capital crime. And just before sunset, his body was removed from the cross and placed in a grave. That was a dark, dark day. To all external observation, that was the darkest day in human history. But, in light of God's grace and the resurrection of that Sunday morning, it was the brightest day, the brightest day in all of human history. That day saw God's clearest expression of love for this world that we are now called to imitate. And the very same thing, at least in illustration, that had to happen for that love to be communicated is the same thing that has to happen in us. Death. Death to self, death to my personal agenda, death to my sensibilities, death to everything in me that is not Christ and Christ alone. That day saw God's clearest expression of love for this world, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That was a death that brought life. That expression of God's love changes time and eternity in the lives of those who receive Him by faith. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All things have become new, says one translation. That expression of love changes time and eternity for all who receive Him by faith. He expressed His love to us while we were still bound in sin. While we were still standing in 
violent and rebellious opposition to him, the death of Christ was poured out on our behalf. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to turn towards something that was a little more appealing to him, a little easier to die for. He loved us in the midst of our sin. And now, and now, my friends, we love because he first loved us. God's love expressed to us in our need, in our sin, gives us the privilege of being messengers of His love to others in their need and in their sin. Just like Jesus engaged the woman at the well in Samaria. A woman, every part of whose life made her detestable to any lone first century Jewish man. Married five times. Now shacking up with a sixth. By herself approaching the well in the middle of the day while Jesus sat there alone. Anybody else would have run screaming from that. And they wouldn't even have been in Samaria in the first place. Jesus chose to go that direction. He chose to walk through the enemy camp. The opposition, the despised Samaritans. He placed himself there and then sat alone at the well and sent the disciples off for food. And the woman came. The woman. Sure, she would have been known that way in her day. You know, the woman coming to the well at an uncustomary time of day. Just trying to be invisible, just trying to stay out of sight because she, she's probably tired of hearing it. But she met Jesus that day because he was there, not elsewhere. Because he was willing, not disgusted. Because he knew his calling was to come and express the love of God for God so loved the world that he gave this son. Where should he be except in the company of such a woman at such a time? We, my friends, we are now called to engage such people in our day. And they will abound. They will abound. But you know what? Only the church can do it. Only the church can do what Jesus did. And even then, they do it with his enabling. It was again Russell Moore who expressed our challenge here. Well, our challenge as a church in these days. There are two sorts of churches, he wrote, that will not be able to reach the sexual revolution's refugees. And I love calling them that. You see... We cannot go this direction and pretend that there won't be consequences for it. Things weren't designed to operate this way, and we do, whether it's acknowledged or not, live in a universe with a sovereign God who has set these things up for the accomplishment of His purpose. You do not rebel against that without consequence, without feeling the disorder of it. And who's going to be there to explain that disorder? Who's going to be there to present the love of God in Christ at such times of need? Who's going to be there to live out 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4? Patience, kindness, no envy, no boasting, no arrogance. The love of Christ. Back to Russell Moore's quote. There are two sorts of churches that will not be able to reach the sexual revolution's refugees a church that has given up on the truth of scriptures, including marriage and sexuality, and has nothing to say to a fallen world, and the church that screams with outrage at those who disagree. That church will have nothing to say to those who are looking for a new birth. 
we must stand with conviction and with kindness, with truth and with grace. We must hold to our views and love those who hate us for them. We must not only speak Christian truths, we must speak them with a Christian accent. We must say what Jesus has revealed and we must say those things the way Jesus does with mercy and with an invitation to new life. There's the calling of the church. That's our privilege in this day. Yeah, dark days, dark days. But are we losing our way? Or is it clear in Scripture how believers are to respond? Is there not a manifestation of grace in this somehow where the lines between light and darkness are clarified for us? such that the light can shine even more brightly? It was Phil Riken who wrote, Jesus does not love us merely to love us, but also to love others through us as we learn to love in the way that he loves. I think that's our calling today. I think that's a good bottom line. Jesus doesn't love us merely to love us. We don't hoard the good grace and love of God. It was intended from the very beginning, just like it was through Israel, just like it was through Adam. It's intended to flow through us into this world. And now in Christ, because we've been granted a new heart in Him, a new birth, reconciled to God, and therefore enabled not just to love God, but to love our neighbor as a manifestation of our love for God. We recognize that his intent all along is to love the world through us. That gospel love going through the heart and life and mouth of a believer into a world of desperate need. He enables it. And he gives us the resources to do it. You know, in my regular, just daily Bible readings yesterday, I ran across a passage that was like God speaking directly to, to our situation here today, our need in our nation today. Would you just take a moment as we're drawing to a conclusion here this morning, would you take a moment and, and, and turn to Isaiah 59? Isaiah 59. I love these sovereign manifestations of God just giving us the text that we need from his word, even while going through systematic progressions through it. This was just part of the reading for the machine Bible reading calendar yesterday. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I've read this passage many times, and I love this passage, but, but wow, what meaning it has. I, I, I'd love to read the whole thing, and it is helpful, but I think the first half of the chapter would take a little explanation to appreciate it most fully. The latter half is, is pretty much straightforward. Israel's sin was great in these days. It was suffocating their righteousness, their, their, their covenant obedience, the situation was dire. Something had to be done. And this text ends up standing at a very critical place in Isaiah, moving from that recitation of Israel's sin to the celebration of the life that is theirs by God's sovereign provision. And I love the way it's worded here. God's word through the pen of the prophet. Beginning at verse 14 of Isaiah 59. So on the next page over, 619. Justice is turned back, <laughs> and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Does that sound familiar? Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Do you see that? He who departs from evil makes himself a prey places himself in harm's way to get eaten up. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man and, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then, oh, and this is beautiful. This should give you chills. His own arm brought him salvation. If you go back to the beginning, is, is, is the arm of the Lord too short to save? earlier on in Isaiah, earlier on in this text. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Listen to this. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Does that sound familiar? 
just like the clothes with which he clothes his children in Ephesians 6. This is the armor of God. God wore it first. But, but look, he's not arming himself with something external to himself. He's arming himself with his own virtues of righteousness and salvation. It's not something added on to him. God doesn't lack something. He had to go find a piece of armor for this battle. No, just, he just put forward his righteousness and his salvation and marched straight at the enemy because there's no man. God's going to have to do this himself. If there's going to be salvation, God is going to have to do it himself. And so he does. And that's what makes me, lo- I mean, in Hebrews 2, reading about Jesus, uh, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Ponder that. The joy set before Jesus is what enabled him to endure the cross, scorning and shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. We're, we're out of Isaiah 59 here. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will render repayment. God will judge. Make no mistake. The judgment is already at the door. We already feel the consequences of sin. God's judgment is active. Rest easy, but in imitation of Christ, don't don't long for the day of that outpouring. In patience, endure. Look for the opportunities to proclaim the gospel that more might come to repentance, just like is the heart of God, knowing full well that no one who rejects that will escape the judgment that will come upon them. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render payment. Verse 19, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from west from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. That means everybody, the whole world, not just, not just his old covenant people, not just the Jews, but everyone. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. Verse 20, and a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouths of your offspring or out of the mouths of your children's offspring. Says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore, he will do it. God will put his spirit in the mouths of his people to proclaim his truth in their day and then continue celebrating it from this time forth and forevermore. Is that good news? That is good news. That's where the church is today, having already received that gift. What was prophesied there in Isaiah 59 is already ours by virtue of our union with Christ. His Spirit taking up residence with us. Him even saying to His disciples, you'll be happy that I go away because if I don't go away, you won't receive the Spirit. But when I go, I will send my Spirit who will unite my church and turn them into one body. This is the very teaching that Paul is giving to the Corinthians. And it's what we're supposed to learn through his teaching to the Corinthians. God will put his spirit in the mouths of his people to proclaim his truth in their day and then continue celebrating it from this time forth and forevermore. That's our blessing in this day. Greater is he who is in us, my friends, than he who is in the world. Yes, the world loses its way in more ways than we can count on any given day. But let not the church lose her way. Let her not forget what her assignment is in this life. Let her not get thrown off course by extraneous things that happen in time and space. Forget about the fact that, yes, we are citizens of this nation, but we are also citizens of an eternal kingdom. And we eagerly await a Savior who's from there. 
And until such time as he arrives, we're about his business, doing his work with the resources he has granted. And my friends, it is a glorious salvation that we proclaim. It's a salvation that can not only reconcile us to God, but to reconcile us to one another so that together we are the arms and legs and hands and feet of Christ in this world today, now. What a joyful time to be the light in darkness because how great is the darkness. We get to be the new covenant people of God in a desperately needy day. What could be better than that? And if you will, let's pray.